Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for being five minutes late. This is like Amtrak. Again, a couple of uh, administrative notes. One is the tour of the campus and grounds, which begins at 5 o'clock, led by Rasafora Monk Angelos, will meet at the bell tower. That's a big building outside the, uh, on the, on the west side. And you should be there if you wish to go on the tour, or, or at least start the tour together, no later than 1655 hours or five minutes to five, five minutes to five. So we're probably going to have a very short period of time between the second session this afternoon, concluding and then going over there. The first session this afternoon, I'm the member of the five-person uh, coordinating team that will moderate that one. So I'll start from here, and then I'll sit down at the table. The topic is the mystery of male and female. By the way, that reminds me, in case you don't know, the men's rooms are <laughs> on the second floor and in the, ba in the basement, and the women's room is in the basement. So if you need to use those facilities, they are separated by male and female, of course. <laughs> so the topic of this one, again, is the mystery of male and female. And first up will be Dr. Edith Humphrey. She is a professor at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, a specialist in scripture, particularly the New Testament. Her title is The Mystery of Male and Female, Masculine and Feminine, The Whys, Wherefores, and watch outs. Boy, do we have good titles at this conference. Father, would you pray for us before we begin? Well, no. Father, Father Luke said we do morning and afternoon. Okay. All right, all right, thank you. It's wonderful to be here and to see in the flesh some people that I have known uh, from afar. Uh, I met some, some friends that I only knew digitally, and it's so much better to get to know what you look like and what you sound like. Um, thank you so much for um, the invitations, so, uh, uh, those who've uh, organized the conference, to uh, Dr. David and the two Dr. Fords, and to Alf and to uh, um, uh, Father um, Webster. Thank you so much, and thank you those who are making our life so comfortable here at the monastery. So the question that I want to begin with is, why should we think in terms of humanity, male and female, as a mystery? After all, our sexuality is essentially something that we share with the animals, isn't it? Linking us with this present age rather than with God in whom the fathers insist there are no passions or parts. It's the pagans who believed in erotic relationships between gods and goddesses, and they believed that this was a mystery. What is it then about our sexuality that could possibly be understood as anything but carnal so far as the Christian is concerned? For the answer, we go back to origins. Both in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 were presented with the creation of humanity as a great mystery. In Genesis 1, God deliberates, so to speak, with himself. And he does this before creating Adam as the crown of his creation. And Genesis then proclaims the paradox. So God created Adam in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Here we get a glimpse of our own complexity. Our unity as Adam, which can be translated <coughs> either human being or humanity. And our duality as male and female. Here also we see our complexity as, to use the phrase of C.S. Lewis, amphibious beings reflecting the image and the likeness of God on the one hand, but also sharing corporeality and sexuality with the animals. And the mystery is deepened in Genesis 2, where we hear for the first time about something that is not good. It is not good for Adam to be alone. So Genesis 2 then backtracks, so to sp speak, to fill in the story of how it is that the female was created, or formed, actually, created maybe the wrong term there. 
This taking of Eve from Adam and his recognition of her as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh adds to what we have learned about God's unitive and dual creation of Adam. It's not just that Adam is comprised of man and woman, but that woman has been taken from man and therefore is his glory, as St. Paul will explain to the Corinthians. So Christians may think perhaps of this as a faint reflection of the eternal begetting of the Son from the Father or the procession of the Spirit from the Father. Together, the man and the woman are Adam, yet they are distinct and one comes from the other. Together, they reflect the image of God and are given dominion over the rest of creation, a nurturing monarchy showing forth the righteousness of God. And together, they partake of that world too for they are embodied sexual beings like the animals. So they stand as a bridge in a kind of priestly position, says Father Schmemann, between the rest of the world and the loving God whom they represent. The genitive narrative, narratives then describe a great mystery. From these mysterious stories, in Genesis 1 and 2 have arisen many speculations as theologians try to push against the bounds of what they do not understand. What was the, orig was the original Adam, for example, a hermaphrodite uh, and only became male after God made the differentiation? Is our sexuality therefore not basic, not a foundational thing, but a secondary stage which will eventually be dissolved? Should we see a human being, whether male or female, as only a half of what it is to be human, something not good in itself, but only good when completed by the other half? The first idea of a double-sexed Adam was posited by the ancient rabbis. The second of an incomplete single person is suggested in contemporary Christian circles, often evangelical, where the married state is considered the norm and the single state as a default position. It would seem that these two ideas push Genesis to say more than it really does. For we know, don't we, that the perfect Adam, the Lord Jesus, was no hermaphrodite. He was circumcised on the eighth day. And he was by no means incomplete without a female partner, though he yearns and cares for the church as his mysterious bride. Alongside Genesis, we have more distinct clues to the human mystery in Ephesians, 2 Corinthians, and in the book of Revelation, which all call God's people or conjure up a picture of God's people as the bride of Christ. And they anticipate the time when we shall be presented completely pure to him. Together then, we bear a feminine, iconic nature, responding to the one who's pictured in divine and masculine terms as our bridegroom. This is not a sideline in the scriptures, but it's so important that it's enshrined, isn't it, in our very worship, particularly in the bridegroom services in which we will again very soon participate. We recognize then a symbolism that is accentuated in the Bible. Redeemed humanity is feminine to Christ's masculine grandeur. Alongside this feature, we also have the corrective words of Jesus to the Sadducees, who were mocking the doctrine of the resurrection. Here, the ancient sect of Jews, the real ruling priestly class, sets a riddle for Christ, a story in which, you all know it, a woman is married to several men sequentially throughout her life. The question, intended to stump Jesus, like the question about taxes to Caesar, is, whose wife will she be? Jesus, of course, doesn't answer the question. Instead, he says that they know neither the power of God nor the scriptures. For in the resurrection, there is no giving and no taking in marriage. Whose is she isn't the right question. But they are like the angels. And in Luke's version, we have the added phrase, and cannot die. So while on the one hand, we speak of human marriage as having eternal implications. I know that um, uh, Mrs. Shmeiman, Matushka Shmeiman, will not abide being called the one who was the wife of Alexander Schmemann. She is the wife. 
So we have that, um, that idea of the eternal implications of marriage. And while we celebrate its exalted status as an icon of Christ's communion with the church, on the other hand, we also know that the resurrected life is not exactly like the current one, and our sexuality will be expressed differently. All these things point to the mystery of humanity as male and female. But how do we come to terms with this mystery? First, I think it's wise to consider how the Virgin and Theotokos, Holy Mary, in relation to Christ, helps us to understand. Father Alexander Schmemann, in his exhilarating book, and short little book, The Virgin Mary, says, being the icon of the church, Mary is the image and personification of the world. That is to say, of the new world that God is making. Most particularly, he means that she is the personification of God's redeemed people, the church. He goes on, Mary is, actually this is in the Celebration of Faith, Volume 3. Uh, Mary is not the representative of the woman or of women before God. She is the icon of the entire creation, the whole mankind as response to Christ and to God. As we say in the hymn, we bring a virgin mother. All of creation rejoices in her. And as it, do, as it does so, it fulfills St. Paul's words that the creation is on tiptoe waiting to see the sons of God come into their inheritance. I love that translation by J.B. Phillips. Mary is the present sign of the great day to come when the effects of the curse will be fully reversed and there will be no more decay or death. Because of Holy Mary's ongoing yes, she has become, as Father Schmemann explains, the locus of Christ's transformation, not just of woman, but of all humankind, and even of the entire creation. Well, what about questions we might have? What about the wherefores? Mary's role in all this helps us with the wherefores that come up when we think of our salvation and of our gendered condition. Some have agonized, if Christ is male, and if salvation depends upon Christ assuming our human nature, how can the female have been assumed in the incarnation, and how can women be saved? There's been a lot of discussion about that in some circles. Next, to be perhaps a little crass or impertinent, does the risen ascended Christ have male properties? What does the, and before we go on actually, what does that question mean for eschatology, for the risen saints, for us, for what we expect to be in our glorified states? And then finally, does it help for us to distinguish between male, female, and the masculine, feminine? We haven't time today to be thorough with all these questions. As a starter, I think it's helpful for us to drop the Western distinction of essential versus accidental when thinking about sexuality. The maleness or femaleness of a particular human being is neither essential to his or her humanity nor merely an outward accident or appearance of who that one is. The woman Eve is not a second creation separate from humanity, from Adam, but she is distinct from Adam. As St. John Chrysostom sp explains in his homilies, uh, one of his homilies to the, uh, to, on, on the, first, the letter of, first letter of Corinthians, she is distinct in her relationship, especially since the fall, but not in her nature from man. As the second Christ, or as the second Adam, Christ recapitulates both Adam and Eve despite their particularities. Jesus is fully male, for he is a particular human being. But his humanity is drawn exclusively from the woman. How is that even possible genetically? The Theoto Theotokos helps us to see that woman is fully involved and fully recapitulated in Christ. And so we are led to be amazed at the mystery. Secondly, in our worship, we consider the risen and ascended Christ to be masculine, the Theotokos feminine, and the saints intact in their gendered natures. 
The fathers have differed regarding the glorified body, whether it retains sexual characteristics or not. But in our icons, in our worship, in our reverence, we continue to relate to those who are glorified as masculine and feminine. Though we may not be able to discover from scriptures or, tradi or tradition whether physical maleness and femaleness is eternal, it would seem that the distinction between masculine and feminine is something that we must preserve that goes on. Woven into the theological grammar of the scriptures and our worship is the idea that gendered language points to a mystery even bigger than that of a male and female in a single marriage. In our day, Bo, both Paul Avdokimov and C.S. Lewis have held on steadfastly to this idea of our gendered nature pointing to something bigger. Avdokimov has speculated concerning mysterious n-static and ecstatic realities to which female and male point. Whereas Lewis has painted pictures and created characters that gesture towards this ineffable duality. I frankly find Lewis's approach more helpful and less apt to lead us into a theological quagmire. And I'm not going to get into Paul F. Dokimov now, whom I love less than I did when I first became Orthodox, but still he has a lot of good things to say. I think that pictures can feed our imagination where discursive reason is more difficult. However, our minds matter. And so, in conclusion of this all too brief discussion of our mysterious state, I'd like to suggest some boundaries, marking off the danger points and giving practical guidelines within which I believe that our ongoing exploration can safely take place. And here I'm adopting, I hope, the patristic method of approaching a mystery apophatically. If our maleness and femaleness, our masculinity and femininity is part of a mystery, well then, what shouldn't we be able to say about it? What we cannot say, and that's so that we will not stray beyond what we know. So here are nine boundaries that I hope will help the explorer to watch out. We cannot say that all symbols are merely human expressions and that language and action are detachable from the reality to which they point. Of course, it's true that some symbols are completely ad hoc. They're just something that people have agreed by convention that that points to this, right? But there are other symbols that partake of the reality. And Father Schmemann is very good on this and is uh, very well known for the life of the world. We cannot say that gendered language is expendable in talking about God or humanity. We cannot say that there is an absolutely confined role for each gender because reversals are part of our story. God can use a Deborah. Or in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, St. Paul talks about the reversal of things because now all males come from females, and on we go. We cannot say that the relations of father, son, and spirit are symmetrical, nor can we say that they are not mutual and equal. Both things are true. An asymmetry and a mutuality. We cannot say that the relations of husband and wife are totally symmetrical, nor ought we to say that there is no mutuality or equality. We cannot say that women, woman and man are two different creations but we also cannot say that man and woman are indistinct from each other. We cannot say that there are no higher gifts and no lower gifts, but all are necessary and the higher need the lower, so that sometimes it's impossible to discern which is more important. In God talk, we cannot forbid the use of feminine imagery. Notice I'm saying imagery, not names. God is like this because the Bible uses this language, and so do some of the spiritual theologians. But in God talk, we cannot ignore the usual or normative use of masculine language, even if it's uncomfortable for some of us today. These, I think, give us some parameters, both guarding us from danger and recognizing the mystery. This mystery we must guard, but also probe in order to give reasons to our sexually confused age. 
We want to remain in Christ to learn more and more of him in our world and to commend what is real and true to others. And finally, having just suggested some chastening boundaries for our minds, permit me to leave us with a picture in order to enliven our imaginations for the refreshment of the spirit, as Lewis puts it. We might not be able to define the final resurrected state because it's even more mysterious than our present human situation, but pictures help us to anticipate it. We need such glimpses of glory in our wounded and soiled state. So here are hopeful images from Lewis's novel, Voyage to Venus or Perilandra, where we meet the king and queen along with the narrator of the story. They're victorious over temptation. They've newly come into the inheritance of the green world and here they command even the respect of what he calls the low G gods, the huge angelic beings whom the reader has already met. You could close your eyes or just listen and try to picture this. All was in a pure daylight that seemed to come from nowhere in particular. He knew ever afterwards what is meant by a light resting on or overshadowing a holy thing but not emanating from it. For as the light reached its perfection and settled itself as it were like a lord upon his throne or like wine in a bowl and filled the whole flowery cup of the mountaintop, every cranny with its purity, the holy thing, paradise itself in its two persons, paradise walking hand in hand, its two bodies shining in the light like emeralds, yet not themselves too bright to look at, came in sight in the cleft between the two peaks and stood a moment with its male right hand lifted in regal and pontifical benediction and then walked down and stood on the far side of the water. And the gods kneeled and bowed their huge bodies before the small forms of that young king and queen. There was a great silence on the mountaintop and Ransom, the main character of the book, also had fallen down before the human pair. When at last he raised his eyes from the four blessed feet, he found himself involuntarily speaking, though his voice was broken and his eyes dimmed. Do not move away. Do not raise me up, he said. I've never before seen a man or a woman. I've lived all my life among shadows and broken images. Oh, my father and my mother, my lord and my lady, do not move. Do not answer me yet. My own father and mother I have never seen. Take me for your son. We have been alone in my world for a great long time. May God give us a glimpse of what it is to be truly male and female and what that shows us about the mystery of the world.